Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to start. Welcome to everybody on a rainy night, full moon, to discuss war on, uh, on the evening that also marks um, Yub van Lissau's birthday. So it promises to be a very interesting um, evening. Of course, um, Yub van Lissau, he does not need any introduction in, um, in Rotterdam. And we're always amazed and surprised by his creations that thread between art, design, conceptual sculpture, and dwelling. He has very provocative propositions about the um, possible new world order that involves um, return to the basics, that involves reorganization of community, farming, uh, return to rituals. It involves an analysis of power structures, um, and really redefining how we're looking at the world um, constantly, especially at times like this, um, where the crisis hits and we're all feeling it more in our marrows and our bones, it becomes even more interesting to um, have his insight and his ongoing research um, back um, to the table. We're very happy that uh, tonight um, you find this out, we'll be joined by a uh, uh, international affairs expert, um, Rob de Weick. Um And he also is very well known in, um, in the Netherlands um, with an expertise um, across the spectrum, but uh, currently he's the director of the strategic studies in The Hague, which he co-founded. And he has uh, also worked quite um, in conjunction and in consultation with the defense industry, if I'm correct, uh, with the military, with the military. Is that a, with military, especially when he was involved with the reorganization of the Dutch armed forces in the 90s. But the spectrum is quite uh, wide when it comes to strategies on um, political policy making um, with a wide range of clients, including the government. Um, so we're very happy to invite you on this out first, who will be joined afterwards by Rob de Weyck. Thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> normally I do lectures uh, far away from Rotterdam and then I can do a hit and run. So uh, I can uh, <laughs> say whatever I want, but here I have to be uh, extra careful because a lot of people know me here. And um, I would like to speak about uh, war, actually my work, but in relation to war and why war. Not that I want to have war, but I'm more surprised that it didn't happen yet in our civilized society. And if this war in Europe, the trans-European war, would start again, uh, what kind of war would it be and what would cause it? You can be all happy that I'm not uh, a politician or a general, and certainly not a scientist or a historian. And I'm very happy that uh, Rob de Wijk is here to, uh, to give it some sense. I'm an artist and I just uh, uh, get inspiration from the world around me and I translate that into sculptures that people can again translate again in a feeling or an impression. So I don't have to be, as an artist, I don't have to be very exact in explaining the, the ideas behind my work. And that's very nice for me. In my um, work, that I've been working since um, some decades now, uh, I always uh, created some parallel worlds. Uh, one of these uh, par parallel worlds was uh, Avialville, a free state that I built in 2001 in the harbor of Rotterdam, a kind of anarchistic place. The second project I will show is the Technocrat, a perfected system of recycling that reduces the human to a small particle in a huge system. Slave City, which I started in uh, 2005 till 2008, I would say. It's a perfected concentration camp with green energy, lots of culture and organic food. And my li latest project, the new tribal labyrinth, a utopian society that tries to find an alternative economic system that will restore the balance between labor and material. First, uh, I will give you some images, very old images from the 90s, uh, that led up to the AVLville. 
uh, this is the Bezo drone. So I created this uh, many mobile homes uh, and many functional objects during my career. Uh, in the sense that I thought this mobile home, so this object could be like a mini universe, a mini world. And this one is dedicated to uh, sex. It's called La Bezodrome. It comes from Bezé and Drome together. And it has only one function, except sex. Uh, that could be drinking and uh, uh, defecating here. The Autocrat. It's a survival wagon that uh, can function away uh, from the civilized world, uh, from whatever the nature gives. So you can catch the rainwater, you can uh, heat, uh, you can butcher animals inside this mobile home. And this was inspired by on the Shakers. And the Shakers is a, uh, a religious uh, community from the States, from the 19th century onwards that uh, lived in a kind of villages. And in the villages, they were completely self-sufficient and uh, they were um, inventing many things. But what the most important thing is that they had uh, uh, a kind of a utopian idea, a kind of communal idea about uh, how they should live. And um, their idea was also that uh, uh, to... Um, to work and to work better and to, crea uh, to create better products is a way of um, worshipping. Uh, so the better products you make, the more products you make, the better you uh, 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 honor God. So that's why they make many uh, products, uh, very uh, sophisticated products, and they made many inventions like the circular saw, the washing machine, and they started to uh, improve seeds. So to improve agriculture. There was a religious group and uh, uh, they lived in a kind of uh, villages, but men and women were completely separated and were not allowed to have sex. And of course, uh, there's only uh, 10 or 15 <laughs> shakers left in the world <laughs> because of this reason. But what I also like much about this piece, which is called the Autocrat, that I uh, wanted to make everything myself, except the raw materials. So I made the stove, the water tap, uh, all the hinges, all the hardware, everything ourselves except the raw materials. This piece from about uh, 2000 or 99 is called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And it was a question, uh, a, uh, a commission from the uh, Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. It's a very good museum in the United States. And they wanted to have a mobile arts lab. So where they could bring the, the good word of culture to the poor neighborhoods and the schools. Which of course is a very good idea. But on the other hand, I was a little bit um, unhappy about it because it, I thought it's too much like design, it's an architecture, the client asks something and I just make something and uh, it's just, um, it's too much design. So I was thinking not to do it, but then I said I will do it, but only on one condition that I can make another piece that can be connected to it. Then this became what I call the good, the bad and the ugly. The good is uh, concentrated in the front part, in the trailer, where there's like a little uh, kitchen and office and a place for uh, exhibitions and where children can uh, work with art. They can have music and theater and all kinds of nice things for everyone. And then the little house was dedicated to the bad and the ugly. And at that time, in 99, the Yuna bomber, which was the most uh, wanted terrorist uh, in the world, was not found yet, and I was very much intrigued in this Unabomber because um, um, I thought it was very interesting because he was like, um, he didn't need like a big organization, he worked completely by himself. Um, he made his bombs of recycled materials. He lived in somewhere in the forest with a little vegetable garden, and he went once a week with his bicycle to the library or the grocery stop, shop or to the post office to bomb, to post his bombs. So, and also the, his ideas were kind of interesting. He was against technology, against globalization. So to me, this was a very interesting uh, uh, terrorist. So I imagined how would he live? So I made this kind of a little bit too big house for him, actually. 
And uh, when the people saw it, they said, oh, it's very romantic. It's like a hunting lodge or something like that. But then on the back side, there was a hidden space where uh, bombs could be fabricated or uh, chemicals mixed. And upstairs was a kind of uh, small experimentation room for um, where you could hire, uh, do experiments on uh, people. So I've been, in those years, I have been making uh, many different uh, objects, uh, uh, power plants, uh, hospitals, uh, mobile homes, and a lot of things. And then in 2001, I said, okay, I have enough stuff to start a free state, like a village, a small village, uh, independent, where uh, there will be um, no rules, uh, there will be no laws, and everything will be possible. So I went to the, to the Elderman of Culture in Rotterdam and I asked, uh, I would like to make this open air museum slash free state. And uh, he didn't really realize what I meant with free state and he said, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so we started uh, building it and putting it all together and, uh, uh, and at a certain moment, uh, now uh, uh, 11 years ago, we opened. Uh, it was very interesting. So basically, um, um, we uh, we didn't have any rules, and all the people working at AVL were allowed to build their houses uh, without any technical or zoning or aesthetical rules. Uh, we built uh, bars. We built uh, many things. We had our own flag. These are some of the structures uh, built by uh, AVL people. This was the restaurant uh, that we opened uh, in order to uh, fund uh, our free state. Of course, we didn't any, have any license, no building permit, no liquor license, no restaurant license, nothing at all. And of course, we had huge uh, problems with it, which I actually didn't expect. Because at that time, I mean, there was a lot of bureaucracy and uh, the, uh, city were, the city employees were a little bit lazy and they didn't care about art. And uh, so I said, well, let's do it. And, you know, it will take years before they discover and so forth. But the nasty thing was it was very popular in the press. So all the newspapers and uh, TV stations and radio stations start reporting about it. And then I make this really big mistake. And I said to the interview in the Algemeen Dagblad, which is a very uh, uh, newspaper, which has been read by uh, people in the city hall. I said, in AVLville, everything is possible. You can do anything you want. If you want to have sex with your dog, you can <laughs> <laughs> then it's no problem. So, and then uh, a lot of people became uh, very angry and they start, uh, what is happening there? And uh, it was also the time that uh, Pim Fortuyn uh, uh, started to come up. And uh, so they said, no, uh, no, uh, no artist, uh, everything has to obey the rules and especially you. So we had made our own money. Um, the money, uh, we introduced the money at the same time as the euro uh, uh, was introduced. And the money, the euro money, I didn't like too much because it just has bridges and gates and it's like there is no identity, there is no heroism, there is no history, there is nothing. So I said I want to develop my own money because it's a free state. And I had the idea if you go to my restaurant and you pay with my own money, you don't need a liquor license. So. <laughs> But anyway, I decided to make the um, uh, to dedicate the money to more heroic subjects. Subjects. Uh, the one AVL was dedicated to weapons and bombs. The five AVL to uh, energy and alcohol. The 25 AVL to sex and mobile homes, and the 100 to uh, food and agriculture. We also had our own. Um, um, Weapons factory is called uh, a workshop for weapons and bombs. And basically, here in this container, there you find all the basic tools and chemicals, normal chemicals, uh, to produce uh, weapons and bombs. This is the office for writing the manifestos, and this is the bedroom for the freedom fighter. This is far before uh, 2001, so this is um, in uh, 97 or so when terrorism was still cool. Okay. 
with me. So we also produced uh, our own energy, a combination of uh, renewable energy and uh, burning waste, a water purification system, and we also made a farm, which is called the Pioneer Set. And basically it consisted of one shipping container, and inside the shipping container you could uh, uh, put a farm and uh, all the tools necessary to, uh, to start this farm. So there's a, a farm that can be uh, constructed out of uh, different parts. This is the farmhouse. The animal house, which is exactly the same size as the and layout as the farmer's house, the chicken house for the pigs and the rabbits. And then, uh, after nine months after we opened, I came to the studio, and the whole street was blocked by cars. There were fire car, firemen, there was police, there was uh, the animal protectionist, there was the environmental uh, uh, people, there was um, the Fiat was there. So uh, the whole thing was, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole street was filled with, um, with people. And they say, because they closed down the restaurant already a couple of times, but we opened it again, of course. And then they say, well, now we're going to close it for good. Otherwise, we will close it for you and we'll send the bill for closing the place. And then I said, well, this is, uh, this is scary because, I mean, I didn't mind that they would close down the place, but that they would send the bill. And then uh, we stopped after nine months. Uh, it was a, a very nice time. Uh, there was a, a lot of people who came. There was a lot of publicity. And I think it was also a very interesting discussion uh, about uh, uh, um, uh, freedom, about uh, less, um, uh, gedogen, which is a Dutch word. Uh, allowing, I would say, would be in English. And, uh, but on the other hand, I was also kind of happy that it was over because the only thing I did at the last months was talking to lawyers and press, and uh, I'm an artist and I prefer to make art. So then I started uh, making uh, artworks and installations, of which I will show um, a couple. This one is called The Technocrat. Which basically is a large... Um, uh, biogas installation. During the time at AVLville, I was the most interested in the infrastructure, like how to produce the energy, how to clean the water, how to, um, how to organize uh, the whole infrastructure. And uh, to me, the most ideal uh, way of water purification would be biogas, so that all the excrement, all the waste is digested and then gas is produced, which you can use to generate electricity and uh, to make gas for heating. And uh, so, still during the AVLville, I um, designed this installation, which was made for 1,000 people. And that means that you need to have uh, more or less 1,000 people. And I was thinking, well, within a couple of years, there will be 1,000 people living in AVLville, and we need this big machine. Um, to, to, um, to work with it. And um, because if you have too little people, it doesn't work. If you have too much people, too many people, it didn't work either. But uh, AVLville was closed. And then I decided to well, still make the biogas installation and find 1,000 people, uh, participants, slaves, or people who just produce excrements in order to make the machine working. So this is the biogas installation. So here is the digester. So here's all the uh, excrements. Uh, uh, they are stirred and heated a little bit, and then the gas is produced. And the rest is safety equipment and purification system. So all the people, this 1,000 people, will be uh, um, stored inside this uh, bunk beds and then connected to hoses that connect to the biogas installation. So when you take out the excrements three times a day, 
And you also have to put food inside because otherwise the whole system will uh, uh, stop working. So that's why uh, I make this large installation to produce food. And to produce food which for a minimum cost produces the maximum amount of biogas. And then there would be one person, the technocrat, who would decide how much food they need depending on the demand for electricity and of the, the supply of uh, food. And the food could be, I mean, you should not, you should, the food could be made of all kinds of uh, products, even waste products. Then in order to keep the participants quiet and happy and to keep the uh, uh, system running, I made the alcoholator. So the alcoholator, which is a large tank that uh, produces 2,000 liters of alcohol a day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on which is then distilled in this machine and then uh, brought to the, um, to the participants. Like that with the food and the alcohol and the excrements, a system of energy uh, would be created. Then the gas which was produced could be burned in this uh, boiler and the steam could be used to produce the food and the alcohol. So and then you get like a whole closed system in which the human being basically is a small particle to keep the machine running. And um, I always wondered, like, uh, I mean, the Second World War, which happened uh, 60 years ago, more or less, or even longer, um, which was in, in Germany, and I always wondered, because Germany is very close to Holland, we almost speak the same language, uh, the, the same kind of background, and Germany was, is, or was absolutely a country with a lot of culture, science, uh, poetry, art, architecture, a lot of things, but still, uh, the, the whole Second World War and the Holocaust happened. And um, this has been all the way, all, uh, taking my, um, uh, attention for a long time and that's why I studied a lot on this history and uh, uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the Second World War. That's why I also created this um, next project which is called Slave City which is a perfected, a perfected uh, concentration camp. You need about 60 square kilometers, let's say 5 by 12 kilometers long of land to make uh, a slave city of 200,000 people. There will be uh, 100,000 men and 200,000 women. Sorry, 100,000 women, together 200,000. All these uh, yellow things are buildings, let's say the call center, the welcoming center, universities, power plant, uh, brothels, uh, data center, etc., etc. And this part here, is a communal part, or for the slave managers actually, where you have the museum, theaters, cinemas, shopping malls, and headquarters. So the idea was to maximize profit. So how can we make as much profit as possible from Slave City? And then uh, I started to make calculations about, I had this huge Excel sheet of uh, consisting of 200 pages uh, in which I calculated everything, the amount of food needed, the amount of water needed, the amount of uh, money that could be made by work, uh, how much electricity, how much light bulbs, how much computers, like a really uh, a very extensive uh, Excel sheet, which proved that uh, a slave city would uh, uh, have a profit of 7.8 billion uh, euros a year, which is an awful lot of money. It's the same amount of money that Microsoft makes or something like that. And with this money, you can do many good things. You can support uh, uh, science, you can support culture, you can uh, even start uh, a small army to change things for the better. So then I started to make uh, all the models and designs for this concentration camp, the slave city. This is the welcoming center, which basically is a selection center and a kitchen and hospital in one. 
And um, so people would uh, enter the, um, the welcoming center and uh, I calculated about 6% of the people would be suitable for to work in slave city. The other people would be uh, not healthy enough or unsuitable to work or even unhealthy and suitable for work and tasteless. Then I started to make these uh, schemes how to recycle the different uh, types of people. So this is the uh, organ transplant uh, department. So organs are uh, uh, taken away and transplanted to other people. I calculated there's about 2.7 organs uh, per person that can be transplanted. So 2.7 people could be saved by one person. So there was also a high-tech hospital inside the welcoming center. For the not so healthy people, there was another solution, consumption meat. Then I started to, uh, to make this uh, uh, recycle department in real size. Where you have the operation room, the blood donors, the cutting tables, where I actually make an analysis of the human being by uh, to have one table with organs, one table with bones, one table with muscles, one table with heads, and so on. And then there was the department, uh, let's say the, the abattoir, the, the slaughterhouse, where the consumption meat could be separated. And all the rests and unsuitable for consumption people would be uh, shredded as raw material for the biogas installation. So the 6% who was suitable to work in a call center, the only way how they can get out of the call center if they are unsuitable. And it means that you're not healthy or not productive enough anymore. This is a schematic drawing of the call center. There was uh, uh, eight, uh, 12 buildings of uh, 20,000 uh, people, inhabitants. And uh, this was the day uh, of a slave in Slave City. Seven hours of work, seven hours of agriculture and service, and seven hours of sleep, and three hours of relaxation. This is the work uh, sleep unit in the call center. So there's one group of people working, the other group is sleeping, and the other group is working on the land or in the service industry. This is the university. Where, of course, only uh, uh, suitable, uh, uh, useful uh, studies were taught. And there was also the 24-7 uh, system. This is the energy plant, which uh, made the whole, uh, enough energy for the whole slave city. So slave city... It was also a city, uh, very environmentally friendly, so it was a zero carbon dioxide city. So all the energy is recycled or renewable. Um, also all the food uh, was organic. Um, slaves were not paid, but they were rewarded with um, pr um, privileges. So basically, if you are a slave, if you are, well, if you're a bad slave, you're recycled. If you are a good slave, you can visit uh, prostitutes, and if you are a very good slave, you can go more often or you can go to one of the special bottles. This is the luxury bottle for men, which is basically not very different of uh, uh, what you will find uh, everywhere in the world. So there's a dancing floor, bars, and places where you can uh, find uh, people, and there are some special rooms for uh, special projects. And basically the whole bottle is in the shape of a womb. This is a little bit more interesting, it's the luxury bottle for women. 
And uh, so this building in reality is a couple of hundred meters long, and, and uh, the male prostitutes, they have to enter this door. And these are all compartments. And between every compartment, there is just a small hole. So if you want to go from one place to the other place, you have to fight your way to the next space, and then again to the next space. That means that only the more stronger, the cleverest, and the meanest men they can go towards the front where they can recover and come in this communal space where you have a final uh, cage fight. And the winner of that is the one that uh, uh, is available for prostitution. <laughs> and uh, basically, this is also uh, a little bit how, how it works in, uh, in nature. And especially, this interested me a lot because it's basically about the survival of the fittest. Like only the meanest, the cleverest, the strongest man will survive and reproduce. And um, this is very natural. On the other hand, it also remembers a lot to social Darwinism, which is an ideology uh, uh, used by um, totalitarian systems like uh, fascists and so on that says, okay, only the best of the best can survive. And uh, in a way, it's a very uh, thin line between nature and the, uh, the survival of the fittest, which also means that we were able to, we were able to develop ourselves to people uh, uh, having lectures and looking uh, at art and uh, a kind of very uh, negative uh, totalitarian system. This is the, um, the headquarters of Slave City. And this is the museum. I wanted to make the biggest museum in the world, which has, of course, the turbine hall and uh, all different departments inside this uh, representation of the human digestion system. Because uh, art has to do, it's a consumption good and has to do with digestion. So this is the uh, entrance, the door to the museum. So here you can see uh, it's a cut open drawing, so you can see all the different departments of drawing, uh, sculpture, installations and so on. But on the other hand, it also has a lot of other places like hotels, uh, libraries, bars, brothels, uh, nightclubs, and so on. And they're all connected with tunnels. So basically, it's a kind of um, um, a labyrinth. So once you enter this world of culture, you will be not, uh, maybe you will not find back your way out. Which basically says that the blindness of people, at least for me, working in art, that you can only look at your surrounding. This is the shopping mall, uh, also uh, very large, the largest of the world, of course. And uh, so you have all the different departments and luxury shops inside. These are all escalators and the corridors. And this is in 2007, where I uh, basically had a, a shopping mall in ruins. Because I thought, I mean, it's like the Tower of Babel, it's called uh, the Mall of Babel. You cannot keep on consuming and consuming, consuming, because at a certain moment there will be an end. Which uh, basically uh, is happening around us right now. Then I uh, made uh, three sculptures. World War I, World War II, and World War III. And basically there were monuments, monuments for weapons, and monuments for wars, or monuments for uh, um, um, heroism. So this is WW1, which was inspired by Austrian cannon, the Skoda 30.5 centimeters. It's one of the biggest cannons of the First World War. And I was interested in it because of the different styles of design uh, of these weapons. This is a more feminine uh, design cannon. This is uh, inspired by um, a Russian cannon from the Second World War, mass-produced, very cheap, 
and uh, not very sophisticated. And this is a contemporary Canon. Uh, it's inspired on an American Canon, which is still in use today. And um, what I like about this Canon is that it's completely built out of uh, um, standard materials, so just uh, tubes uh, and plates that are all welded together. So you don't need uh, high technology, you just need a, um, a saw and a welding machine. Um, then, <clears throat> I was making another monument, which is called the monument, and basically it's a monument of something that could happen in the future. Uh, I don't know what, but uh, uh, it's very uh, violent. And you can never say um, if violence is good or not, if a revolution is good or not. Time, time will decide. I mean, the uh, uh, French Revolution was a big difference for our society. And I was thinking, like, uh, you know, what could how will our future be? Will we have a revolution? Will we have a war? And what will be needed for that? And um, one of the things is that with our civilization, we have a lot of people, always more people, uh, consuming more and more. And you can really ask yourself, how long can we continue with this? How long can we uh, uh, use our lands? How long can we use our oil and our raw materials? will be there an end. And in our society we are very clever. We have a lot of uh, technological possibilities to increase production. We have fertilizer, mechanized uh, machines. Uh, we have genetically manipulated uh, uh, seeds and uh, animals that can produce more and more food and more and more materials. But it also makes a very high technology system, which is also very sens sensitive to disturbance. Since it's so uh, high tech, a small thing can go wrong, and there will be uh, um, uh, a collapse. You can combine it, uh, compare it a little bit with uh, a Formula One car, which is highly technology, and goes very fast, and is uh, super good. When something goes wrong, there is a big accident. When you have a truck or an old car, it will not go very fast, but it's more uh, stable. This is the project <coughs> which I'm working now. It's called the New Tribal Labyrinth. And um, this is a new utopian project in which I uh, reinvent the um, industrial revolution. So I'm going to uh, invent all the big installations and factories that were necessary and were uh, very important for our development from agricultural society to a highly developed society. So this is, for example, a blast furnace. And um, so this, this, I'm creating this imaginary world for this new tribe that um, um, uh, sorry, I lost my text. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, reinvents uh, uh, all the industrial. Uh, um, uh, machines and as um, uh, um, uh, 
<laughs> I don't know, I have a blackout. Or I say that. Um, so anyway, um, I start over again. So the new tribal labyrinth. And um, so I will reinvent all the big machines and industry that were necessary for our industrial production. Uh, I will do it in such a way that there is no electricity or uh, needed. So all the machines are um, I, uh, propelled, powered by human force. And if you see the machines, you cannot really say if it's uh, a post-elliptic uh, 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 machinery that's, you know, that's the only thing that's left uh, after a big disaster and there's a difficult start again, or if it's a utopian new uh, society where people decide, decide to, uh, re to reproduce all the necessary materials. And it's about, uh, also about uh, the value of material. So if you make steel in this blast furnace, which will take a lot of energy, will take a lot of labor, you have a very uh, good, a very interesting material. Uh, because there is, it, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money to produce it. So if you do it like that, you will have a, a piece of steel like this, which will take weeks to produce. And it's special and you, will be, you have to be very careful with it. In that sense, uh, the new tribal labyrinth also uh, brings back a balance uh, of uh, labor and material. So nowadays material is very cheap. Uh, a piece of steel costs almost nothing and labor is very, very expensive. And by um, reformulating the production method, this balance will be restored. This, for example, is a nafta cracker, which is a very uh, important machine in the chemical industry. And basically it makes, uh, uh, out of oil products or wood uh, dust, you can produce uh, fuels and material for the plastic and medicine fabrication. Uh, this machine is very um, improvised and basically um, very inefficient and also very dangerous to operate. The chance that you will die by operating this machine in order to produce a, a plastic cup is rather high. but it makes the product really special. And uh, although uh, it's um, a kind of a, a project that has two sides, has a very ideological side of uh, reinventing the economy, and it has a dystopian side because it's a uh, hard work and it's very dangerous, and, but together it has a, a message of uh, uh, um, being... Um, um, not being wasteful with uh, the world around us. This is a furnace to melt metals. This as well. And uh, basically, um, uh, the new tribal labyrinth is also a kind of, um, has a parallel to the arts and crafts movement uh, that in the 19th century tried to um, protect the arts and the crafts from the upcoming industry. But now, at this time, it's the industry itself that needs to be protected. Because uh, all the production is done in counties where it's the cheapest. And, um, uh, and here, in our civilized world, we are left with uh, people from the service industry. Lawyers, designers, uh, salespeople. This is a small loom, so to make uh, textiles, which is basically a kind of machine in which the human uh, uh, is, um, uh, um, becomes one with the machine. And this is the um, sawmill that we are making at this moment. This is called the everybody's plow. It's a plow that can be uh, operated by uh, humans. And uh, this is one of the farms that I will make in the future. So the idea is to make uh, seven to ten uh, different farms, real size, of different periods. And uh, at the end I will 
put all those farms together in a kind of a labyrinth and will be connected with corridors and tunnels. This one is called the Hagioscope, which is basically a farm from the year zero, literally. It's the kitchen, oh, sorry, the postmodern uh, carpenter shop, the bedrooms, Uh, this is the, called the Insect Experimental. It's an experimental uh, farm to grow insects. And so basically here you put uh, mealworms that will uh, uh, grow up, become pops, and then beetles. They will lay eggs, and those legs will be falling down to the um, grid. And then they will grow here, and then finally they will come here, and then here, they will be attracted by light and heat and smell. So I try to make a kind of a population of worms that reproduce themselves and offer themselves for consumption. And this is a large scale and insect farm. So insects, uh, according to a lot of people, uh, are uh, considered to be the food of the future because you don't uh, need a lot of uh, energy, water, and nutrition to grow an insect. So if you want to have one kilogram of meat, you need about 10 kilograms of grain to produce it. And with insects, you only need 1.1 kilogram of grain and less water and no space, very few space and few energy. This is called the temple. It's a subterranean uh, space. With some funnel heads. And these are some uh, sculptures for the people, for the inhabitants of the new tribal labyrinth. This piece is called Pantarai, and basically it's three figures that are all connected with uh, tubes and funnels and uh, connected with the foundation. So basically all the fluids, all the uh, elements of the sculpture are connected. And then uh, this was the last slide. So. Sorry for my blackout. <laughs> Too many uh, people that I know in the space, I think. <laughs> Rob, if you are ready. <laughs> Me? Yeah, my, my question is actually, uh, do you think that um, a, war could, uh, a war could start, a trans-European war, and uh, how, what kind of war it would be? Uh, and, this is, um, and this is the real world, huh? this is not, not fiction. Uh, oh yes, it could very well uh, start, that is possible. In, in my view, if you look what the effect of the austerity measures right now is, for example, in, uh, it's quite visible in, uh, in Greece and Spain, where people go on the street and they, uh, uh, they start rioting, uh, that was to be expected that something like this uh, would happen in Europe. And we, you started uh, by saying your, uh, 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 an hour ago uh, that uh, you were a bit amazed that war hasn't yet broke out in Europe, but it did in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a series of Balkan wars uh, which were quite damaging, and many people after the end of uh, the Cold War didn't expect that this, something like this would happen, and yet it happened. And it was to be expected, because if you have big changes uh, taking place 
uh, then all of a sudden you will see that uh, that war happens. So it did, and uh, people like me um, expected it to happen, and it happens because it always happens when big changes take place. Now, big changes are already visible now, or also visible now, and it has something to do with, with the financial crisis. And you see that people go on the street. Uh, I don't think that a, a major war can break out in Europe. Uh, and one of the explanations is that people get too old. Uh, only young people go to Haren in the northern part of this uh, country. Uh, and old people uh, don't go to Haren. And they go, don't go uh, on the street uh, to fight uh, against austerity measures. But young people do. So what, you, what, you, what is highly likely what will happen if uh, we uh, do not solve uh, the whole financial crisis uh, within a couple of months, maybe years, and, uh, and the economy goes down and it will affect our prosperity, then it's highly likely that uh, all over Europe you will have uprisings. And this is something that, that, that uh, hopefully will not take place, but it is quite realistic that it will take, uh, take place. And what you then see, and it comes very close to, uh, to your work, is that we probably will give up parts of our sovereignty, parts of our democracy, in order to keep the whole thing under control. So I was thinking about this when I saw the, um, the slides of your work, because it is something that really comes, comes really, well, not, not really close, because I think you, you exaggerate a little bit, because you, and you have to do that, but it, it comes close to the mechanisms you describe. Right? You, you, you give up human dignity, you give up democracy, except then in your project uh, on the free state. Uh, but uh, you really see that, that things will move and that freedom will be affected in the end. Yeah, one of the things, oops, one of the things that I uh, uh, discovered when I was uh, studying the Second World War is that the origin of the Second World War is very much related to, um, to food. And in the 30s, there was, I mean, there was also a big crisis and there was not, almost not enough food to feed all the Germans. And they had all the land they had, they were making agriculture, mechanized agriculture, but still there was worries about the food. And uh, so that's why they were thinking, well, what can we do about that? Well, let's look at Poland, because they have huge amounts of land, and the agriculture there is very primitive. And so if we would, the Germans would go there to start high-tech uh, farming farms, uh, use the, the Poles as cheap labor, and, uh, and the Germans as a kind of a uh, I said, uh, gentlemen farmers. Uh, that would be very good. And then they say, where can they live? Well, we, they can live in the houses of the Jews. And so there is in, in archives, there's all this kind of calculations and statistics that, uh, uh, about this subject. So it has a very rational uh, background. Now, our society is that our society becomes very, very rational. Everyone has an Excel sheet on his computer, and many decisions are made because of these calculations. No, but we're talking about food. Food is a driver. Huh? Oh, food, food is a driver for conflict. That's that's for sure. If you go back in history, for example, 1848, yeah, a long time ago. But nevertheless, we had revolutions all over Europe. One of the driving factors uh, uh, was the high food prices, uh, which was caused, for example, by, uh, by a mice plague, which raged all over Europe. Uh, so the, the crops were spoiled and destroyed. And uh, we talk about the Arab Spring. I hate the word Arab Spring because that has nothing to do with freedom and democracy. That is what we think, that is what we want in this part of the world. Uh, people longing for freedom and democracy, that might very well be the, the case. But your argument was far more important. If you look at the statistics, unfortunately I don't have uh, my PowerPoints uh, with me. Otherwise I could uh, show you that uh, in 2008 we had an all-time high uh, with respect to food prices. And what happened in 2008 
in 30 countries that were revolutions. In 2011, early 2011, we saw a new all-time high of uh, the food price, and also the commodity prices were at an all-time high, including the energy prices. And again, that was the start of the of the uprisings in the Arab uh, world. So there is a clear correlation between food prices and unrest, and uh, that's perfectly explainable. If people don't have to eat, eat, then you have a problem. But moreover. If you um, uh, have a very, very low income, and uh, you, uh, you, 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 you earn not more than, let's say, one dollar a day, and then the food prices start with 20, 30 percent, that means trouble, because you can't, you, you, you can't pay for the food anymore. And that's exactly what's happening. So the food prices were the, 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 the most important factor that uh, explained the, the, Arab, uh, the Arab uprisings. And of course there was a clear correlation uh, between extreme weather conditions all over the world early, uh, late 2010, um, and, um, and also the rise of the energy price, but that is something else because that increases the transport uh, cost of uh, food prices. So you are absolutely right. This is a very important uh, uh, factor which can be uh, uh, proven uh, by numerous historical examples. Well, the, new, uh, the, the idea is I started uh, working with a new tribal labyrinth was mm -hmm. that uh, what I see in our society that uh, very few things are still produced in here. Very few agriculture, very few industrial products, and uh, so very few real economy. So most of the products that come from abroad, very far away in countries where it's a very low cost. We are very wealthy because we can make a lot of money with transporting and trading and making publicity and all kinds of services with this. But this can only happen if there is a, a very boomy economy. A lot of people are buying stuff and buying stuff and there's new products and we want to have it again and more and more and more. But at a certain moment, I think there will be like a moment that there is people don't want to buy that more that much anymore or they don't have the money or no need. And then we are in a very dangerous situation that there is a, a lot of people that made money of little things in between, well, uh, without a job yeah. and without that's, money. That's absolutely correct. That's uh, what, what is clearly visible. If you look at the Dutch economy, it's 70% service economy, 30% mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing and, uh, and some transport. Uh, and that makes the whole economy extremely vulnerable. Uh, the good news, however, is that uh, China is getting more expensive. And that you see uh, that uh, the manufacturing of goods is now flowing back in, in, mo in, modest, in a modest way back to Europe again. That's very interesting what's, uh, what's happening. So it's, uh, it's better to produce it here in Europe. And that also has also to do with the fact uh, that our um, wage costs uh, come down. Um, and that is something uh, especially visible in the northern uh, part of, uh, of Europe. So we see uh, a, a kind of a reversion of, 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 of history where industry comes back. And that's quite promising, uh, but we really do not know uh, what the effect will be in the long run. But uh, yes, here you are again uh, right. It's, uh, it's a trend that is clearly visible. But if you can go back to history yeah. again and again, that also probably will... Um, um, the, the country will become protectionist again. So that means like if you only buy European or Dutch or whatever yeah. products. Yeah, but that holds especially true for uh, commodities, for raw materials. Uh, one, if you talk about war, uh, then the most likely cause of war is raw materials, energy and commodities. Uh, that's the most likely cause. Uh, like the cause of war. Uh, if you uh, look at the statistics and you look what's happening, what, what has happened over the last uh, two decades, for example, in Africa, uh, then, you, then the conclusion is that uh, 18 out of the 20 civil wars, wars that were uh, waged after, uh, during the last uh, 20, 20 years had to do with raw materials. And you can fight wars on anything. In Rwanda, for, uh, a short war was fought 
on cashew nuts. It's really incredible, but okay, that's what people did. And it's very interesting. Everybody reads the papers or watches the news. And what you see right now uh, um, uh, is this, uh, this problem uh, about the uninhabited islands between China and, Jap uh, and Japan. The reason why this is a problem is because of the huge re uh, reserves of oil and gas in this, under the seabed. That is the reason why we have uh, uh, this, this diplomatic and also almost a military incident uh, between Japan and China right now, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. And it's, es it's escalating. And it has something to do with raw materials needs of a country like China. And do you think that we uh, can afford a war, or do you think that we even, even can make money <laughs> with the war? Well, some people, uh, some people make money uh, by selling uh, uh, weaponry, of course, to the uh, to the war fighters. Uh, of course, all, there are always winners uh, during war, but usually uh, um, everybody loses if if war if war breaks out. Um, and that is, of course, uh, clearly visible if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the Balkans. Uh, who is the winner there? N no one. Uh, the, the countries who carried out an intervention, NATO, is not a winner. It's a loser because they are stuck in this, uh, uh, Western countries are stuck in this uh, conflict, which is a frozen conflict, um, for, for decades now. Uh, look at Afghanistan, uh, the one who carried out an intervention, uh, the West. Uh, is not really the big winner in Afghanistan. Uh, the people in Afghanistan are also the loser. No, uh, a war breaks. War breaks out, uh, but it produces mainly uh, uh, losers. Do you think we can prevent the war in the West? No. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, time is ripe for war. Believe it or not, but sometimes people desperately want to fight wars because they have no other options uh, anymore. It could very well be uh, that uh, because of you, because you don't have um, um, any idea of what the future should look like and that war is the better option. Uh, but war can also break out unintentionally. And 1999 is a very good example when NATO invaded uh, Kosovo. Uh, what happened then, uh, NATO issued 25 last warnings to Milosevic. Well, for your own credibility, uh, the 26th time, you really have to carry out an intervention. Otherwise, you are not credible anymore. And no one wanted this intervention. So that's what, that's what happened. And a deliberate choice was, of course, the intervention in Afghanistan after 9-11, because people thought, well, uh, the Taliban allows um, uh, the uh, Al Qaeda to use uh, Afghanistan as a free uh, as a free space as a sanctuary. Uh, so sometimes you have uh, wars by choice, but usually uh, wars um, happen by accident. First World War is a very interesting example. We know exactly how the First war, uh, World War broke out. And if you try to simulate that during war games, it never breaks out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any uh, questions from the public, maybe? Yeah. But I have one for you. Mm. What is exactly the red, the, the, the red thread Throughout your work, the red thread. The, yeah, what is what is what binds? It? Oh, the red thread. Sorry. What 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 <laughs> what, bind, what binds it? What binds it? What is what is the idea? What is the idea behind it? I ha I have a view on this, but please explain it to me. Um, yes, I think um, uh, that very. Almost all the artworks can be brought back to a contradiction or a contrast uh, between rationality and irrationality, and good and bad, and ugly and beautiful, uh, real and surreal. So, like, uh, but the most important is the rational and the irrational side. So, how rational can you be, and what are the dangers of being rational? Rational, and what are the good things of being rational? Yeah, there is indeed. A, um, yeah, there's an. Uh, how to call it, there is also a contradiction in your work, and I like that very much because that makes it very interesting. It's 
also in my view about freedom and control, mm -hmm. which is a huge contradiction. At the, at the one hand, there's freedom, freedom uh, uh, in the hands of those who oppress mm -hmm. and control, uh, and of the people they oppress. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. And is that recognizable? Is it true or not? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, it's also very much about about ethics. Like, you know, what what do we think about what is good or bad? So, yeah. is a concentration camp bad if you can earn a lot of money with it, in order to do many good things, to have uh, good healthcare, culture, science, and things like that? Or should we not do that at all, uh, being on the safe side? but then having less possibilities. Does this fit in a tradition? Because it looks Sorry? like, does this fit in, in, in a tradition? Because this looks like a combination of Pol Pot, Orwell, and, uh, <laughs> and Waterworld. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's why I said, uh, uh, you can be very happy that I'm not in politics, so, uh, <laughs> general. <laughs> um, yes, and I, I'm of course, I'm very much, uh, uh, happy to live in this time because it's one of the most exciting times in the world uh, with so much development and so much uh, wealth mm -hmm. and with also so many threats. I mean, this is uh, uh, a very interesting time. I mean, with the... Is it scary or interesting? What is it? But, um, well, if you see it from far above, I mean, if you see it, you look at the world and the human is just one of the animals living in the world. So, and for the world, it's not bad if humans would uh, disappear or would be a big disaster. But for the humans, of course, it's not so nice. But the, 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 the theme war you choose, mm -hmm. you're elaborating uh, right now. Is this also about this contradiction between rationality and irrationality? No. I have more easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, uh, I never was confronted with any war or any violence. Uh, and also not, uh, I mean... No, but yeah. the theme. Mm -hmm. Is that also about rationality and irrationality and freedom and control? No, war is like the, the total disaster. And I think uh, that's, that is not really rational or irrational. Oh, it's, I think so. Yeah. A war could be highly rational. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you look at um, what's happening right now in Syria, mm -hmm. uh, everybody says that uh, uh, what Assad does is irrational. But it's, as a matter of fact, it's highly rational because he has no other option. Uh, he's leading uh, a small segment of the population, the Alawites. Uh, if he gave up his position, it, uh, his group, his clan, is finished. He is indicted uh, um, by, by the UN, mm -hmm. by the International Criminal Court. He will go to, uh, uh, to, uh, to The Hague if, uh, if he loses. So it's highly rational to continue the fight. And at the same time, the way people behave within that fight, within that war, is highly irrational. Uh, we, yesterday on the radio, there was this awful story about uh, the rape of women, which is part of every uh, war, uh, by the way. Uh, so what you see is that for quite a few people, War is also the ultimate freedom, because there are no rules. You can do whatever you want, although there are, of course, formal rules. But for many people, they don't apply. But if and it was clearly fits in your, uh, in my view at least, <laughs> in the theme of, um, of, of your work. If he was rational, he would buy a super big cruise ship and uh, go on international waters with uh, a lot of uh, food and uh, services. That is what I like, too. And, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, no, but this is this is about rationality and irrational uh, in irrational uh, irrationality at the same time. That's one of the reasons why I found 
war, although I discussed it, of course, and I even can't watch uh, mo uh, war movies on television, I asked uh, Doreen, uh, because I fell asleep and I don't want to see it, because I don't like it. Uh, but uh, the fascinating thing about war is the strange combination of about control and freedom, absolute freedom, and about rationality and irrationality, at least in my view. Um, this, oh. Sorry. This, um, <laughs> there's only one mic. I have a question or more so a remark concerning the last thing that you said. There is some sort of lightheartedness in, in your work or light lightheartedness or humor. Humor, okay. Humor, yeah. Um, which I like and which makes maybe difficult stuff more understandable, but isn't it, in, or isn't it hard within what you do to indeed um, speak about or tap into real present conflicts? I mean, you talk about the Second World War and that can be rom ro romanticized, but um, I mean, like for example, Syria is happening now, mm -hmm. and we see these disgusting images, and wouldn't... Well, my point of view, I don't think art is there to give answers. I think uh, art is much more to uh, uh, create awareness or to maybe give a disturbance in order that uh, people can reformulate. So I never want to give uh, an answer or a way how to think. Actually, I just make a dangerous pass or like a, a, a labyrinth where you can get lost or maybe you can find something. So uh, sometimes the work is very humorous and sometimes uh, it can be very serious and sometimes it can be really uh, uh, very dangerous. So, um, But is it for you a constant decision not to make a reference towards the, the, the present conflicts or... or but I, no, I mean, my, my work makes a lot of references mm. to the present time. Mm. I mean, it's about our economy where we are living now. And I mean, it's not that my work is about war. My work is much more about our society, know. about yeah. economy, about power, about uh, civilization, about ethics. Mm -hmm. And war is just, uh, uh, and violence is just a small part of it. Okay. But we were talking about it now. So. Yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you. Question now. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, why do you uh, say um, like the, the the creativity is getting out of the people when? Uh, no, you didn't say that. But uh, I mean, uh, creativity is the base of everything. Every every little piece of material you hold is, is based out of for creativity, you know? Uh, so why did you make something like a, a man that lives like a pig and then uh, you try to get create the biggest museum in the world? Why is that that, that contrast between the, the la life of the slaves and the the people in the in the biggest museum of the world. Um, when you have have these people that are um, mostly living in inside of a, a tomb or a, a bed or uh, whatever they work in a call center or um, why is there why isn't there a, a place where you can allow people to live freely, to explore more of the creativity they have to live in. You want to say there should be an art school in uh, Slave City? No, <laughs> no, no, not an art school. More like uh, a free society of so, uh, within the slavery. Well, there's three hours of relaxation a day that you can uh, you can spend how you want. Within Slave City, but I mean, but but, but do the people uh, get insane or something? 
didn't they get get no no freedom at all so no education no well i think that uh, the the slave city as i uh, propose it uh, i don't think it will work very well i mean um, no no okay no because but, it, uh, but it's, it's the a reality to, we can create right the idea that the, the idea is that the slaves do very high tech uh, work so you need to have very intelligent uh, people mm -hmm. to work as slaves and they are not i mean it's not very likely they can do good uh, um, give good services or inventions or I, itc ict uh, uh, solutions when they are slaves so but um, but you need progress, right? You need progress. Yes. In a, in a sense. So how do you, how do you get that proce uh, progress in in the in the in the in the lives of of the 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 people that control the slaves? So how do you get progress in the people, uh, uh, like the managers of Slave City? Yeah, send them to the museum and... Uh, yeah. Were there any Arab Springs a visit in, uh, in Slave City? Uprisings? Um, the, um, the whole security system that I didn't really develop, but it was uh, supposed to be very high-tech. So, um, if there would be like a, a revolution or an uprising, there would be very simple uh, push the button solution. And how do you do that then? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't. I mean, this, you get this kind of science fiction-like kind of things and capsules inside you. But I, I really didn't like to go that way because uh, as a, uh, it was not attractive to me the high tech part. Why not? It's too much like uh, narrative, too much like science fiction. Okay. And I was more interested in um, making the factories and the brothels and the farms and uh, the hospitals. Sorry, can I, can I ask a question? You hinted towards it as well uh, yourself about the word of the labyrinth. But I was thinking at your, 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 your work, the project, you call it the new tribal labyrinth. Why did you choose the form of a labyrinth? Because normally, also formally, your work, there's always a grid or a very fixed structure, although it's not necessarily the most strict grid, but there's always a very fixed form. Yeah. Yet a labyrinth goes all directions. So why did you choose for this particular project the idea of the labyrinth? Or what do you find appealing to that form? Because there is not a straight line in a labyrinth. So it's always like you have to go left, right, back and forth. And uh, there is no beginning and no end. So that's what I like about uh, the labyrinth. So basically, with the new tribal labyrinth, I'm not going to give any answers again. I'm going to just show solutions that basically don't work or might work, uh, but probably not. So that's why the, the labyrinth in getting lost uh, is, is the preferred form. Could you say in that sense it's very different from Slave City? Which appears to be very strict and organized and it's a closed circuit. Everyone has their purpose, everything has its place and you'll yeah. know, you know what to expect from everything. I mean, you talked about the major Excel sheet of mm -hmm. the output and yeah. the input. So this project would be different in that sense that there's, you don't know where it'll end up either. Yeah, Slave City is a, a system. Slave City is an organism that is like everything is connected. And the new tribal labyrinth is, a, well, you could say more like an, an anarchy or like an unpredicted um, uh, path. Although I have to say the new tribal highway sounds also very good. <laughs> Next project. <laughs> can sing too. Um, if you would compare the slave city and the last project you're working on, if you would try to compare it to war, which one is closest? Because you just talked about the organism, organism, well, organistic side of the last project and the slave city project is more like nature. 
So which one is war or closest? I think uh, slave city is absolutely more likely to have uh, uprisings and revolutions and uh, wars, especially because uh, a lot of money is being made in slave city that has to be spent on stuff. So uh, uh, like that, it's much more likely that people get more possessive, powerful, greedy, and then you have the 200,000 uh, uh, slaves which are probably not very happy. So uh, this will be very, very dangerous. And um, I think the new tribal labyrinth uh, basically is more like a, a hippie farm. So the, I don't think they will start a war. There was no brainwash department in the in, in slave city. Because well, it is something you would expect to make the whole thing more manageable. No, I mean, there was very strict uh, surveillance because all the slaves, they work uh, on computers. So and then many things uh, can be controlled. The productivity can be, called, can be um, um, controlled. Uh, the output can be controlled. So there's a lot of uh, ways how to control the slaves. And then appropriate measures can be taken if the productivity is not high enough or if they do something wrong, they speak with the wrong people. Yeah, it's machines working with machines. Yes. That's what it was, yeah. Yeah, then I would expect a brainwash department. Because then you can model them into machines. I, I have a question here at the top. Um, uh, yeah, your war monument um, pieces reminded me of an open call that I saw recently for uh, new monument in Washington DC, which is a monument to Cold War victory. And yeah, I was just wondering what you might propose as a sort of form for this, or you know, what are the problematics of even proposing this idea in the first place? So what I would propose for the monument for the, uh, the victory on communism. That's what you said, there. Eh? Oh, Cold War victory, okay. Yeah, I would make something completely uh, heroic from, I would make like a Soviet monument, like style with, you know, people going forwards with big flags and I would do, I would make, uh, I would make a monument for the Cold War uh, from the other side of the curtain then. <laughs> Very likely, will, they will not give me the commission. <laughs> um, my question is for Rob. Um, when you look at the history of um, European avant-garde, especially futurism in 1909, um, with the poet Marinetti, um, he was really influenced by the sounds of war, um, Balkan war. He was a volunteer journalist in 1912, and that really made him actually denounce romantic tradition, museums, disrupt um, explode typography in graphic layouts and um, the same way some of the early European avant-garde women poets were fighting actually in Syria w aligning with the Christian minority there which is not unlike now um, and now you look at Ai Weiwei the most feared artist in the world in a way like he has so much potency in a way to change the perception of China vis-a-vis -vis rest of the world. Maybe he doesn't have as much impact in China, but outside of China. What would you see the role of the arts or the role of the artists in Europe as a potential revolutionary force or as a potential society changing force? That's a very good question and a very difficult one. Um, I think that um, that the perception of, of war and uprisings has, has changed. There was, 100 years ago, there was a certain naivety with uh, respect to war and uprisings and crisis, especially uh, uh, before the, the First World War. Uh, there was a kind of romanticism uh, when this war broke out. Uh, soldiers went to the front uh, uh, with teddy bears. Uh, there was uh, a kind of cheerfulness about uh, this war uh, and it and in the end it was the most awful war ever 
with uh, the, the most casualties ever. Uh, so there was a, a certain kind of naivety and romanticism. Because of the of mass media, this all has changed. I think that we now have a much more nuanced uh, uh, picture of uh, uh, of war, and you simply cannot ignore anymore the, the atrocities that take place because you will see it day after day on television. Uh, in this respect, uh, I think, but I really have to think about it um, that the role of 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 the of art also changes with it. Um, look at the 1960s. Uh, then you had this anti-war movement, which was also uh, protesters. We had also in uh, in in in, the, in this country, uh, Bob Dylan started this one. Uh, so it was an anti-war uh, movement, um, uh, um, which was also created uh, by artists. And that is, I think, I think a big difference uh, uh, if you compare this to, let's say, the early uh, 20th century. That is my, that's my guess. What do you think? Well, I think uh, <laughs> just before the, uh, the First World War, I mean, it was a very, um, well, let's say, boring society. You had to a choice to work in a factory as a laborer or to work in a farm. and you know, or to go to war, I mean, to travel, basically. Uh, that could be nice. But now there are so much uh, nice things for everyone to do uh, every day that it's like uh, going to war. It's not really like a, a kind of a tourist uh, attraction anymore. And um, I mean, this like a lot, of, especially the First World War, I mean, this was like uh, adventure, like a, a lot of wars, like, you know, let's go fight, let's be men together. And, but for, for some people, it still is. That is something we do not want to accept. But again, I mentioned it before, war is complete freedom. And uh, that has a certain attractiveness in it. And it uh, also is uh, a, a kind of addiction. Uh, what you see is, believe it or not, that, that fighters go from one war to the other. Uh, I've been a couple of times in... Uh, in um, in Afghanistan, and if you in your bodyguards, they move from one war to to another, and that's a way of life. That's you know that's that's what they want. That is uh, they they can't do anything else anymore. Do you think uh, it's like that because they go back to the origin of the the human species uh, as a hunter, like you know, the, well, tribes in a, person? In 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 a way, in a way, yes. I I had uh, lengthy conversations uh, with those uh, with those guys because usually they're not not much to protect, at least uh, not in my case. Uh, so you you have ample uh, opportunity to to discuss and. Uh, Normal life is boring. This is about, indeed, it's quite primitive. It's about, uh, uh, it's about hunting, and it's about uh, uh, defending, and it's exciting. And, oh yes, uh, you, you can be killed. Uh, but that's all in the game, and they don't, don't, don't worry. At least they lived a life which was not average and not boring. And uh, I was really uh, amazed about uh, about this when I saw this uh, uh, for the first time. But there are people who think like that. It's addictive. But don't we romanticize it now a little bit too much? Well, don't we romanticize it a little bit too much? No, now? no. Well, yeah. well be it's, be it's be before, just like yeah, yeah, yeah. In the old days, we did so. Yes. Because if two people with guns standing across from each other, that I can understand. But I saw footage of like in the, the Balkan Wars where these big drunk machine gun armed men take these Muslim men into the bush and play around with them and tape the entire thing and then act like shooting them and then don't shooting them and it takes hours and hours and what you said about the imagery like artists do have a role in the 60s when you know like the Vietnam War was present and it went on television people started to revolt. But isn't now a danger also that we are so bombarded with images that we just don't care anymore? Oh yeah, absolutely. But on the other hand, uh, there was some, uh, a, a 
great support among the people to go to Kosovo in 1999 uh, for the intervention in Afghanistan, even for the intervention in, uh, in Iraq, although it was completely unjustified, legally, legally and morally. Both Libya. Three of them? That uh, all the, yeah, yeah there, was, there was considerable support. For example, also here, with respect to Libya last year, there, there was a majority among the Dutch people, population, who was in favor of an intervention. Does that tap into this gung ho mentality? No, it has. It, it is. A, it's really strange. What? Uh, why this is the case? People, people. Uh, there is a strong moral obligation to do so. People, we in the West do not like the suffering. This is a, a, a typical Western thing, um, because w the West is the only civilization, if I may call it like that that carries out interventions outside its own ter down territory, but even not jurisdiction, uh, outside its own civilization. For example, you know we had this, uh, these problems with Northern Ireland, uh, which, thank God, has been solved uh, a couple of years ago. Now imagine that the Chinese would carry out an intervention in Northern Ireland, because they didn't accept the suffering of the people in Northern Ireland anymore. Now you start to laugh, for good reason, but we do so in other parts of the world, in other uh, civilizations. This is one of the reasons why, for example, we have this clash uh, between uh, the Muslim world and the Western world. But there is a very, very strong uh, um, uh, sense of moral obligation in this part of the world that we should do something. And doing something is always very harmful uh, because doing something is not optimal and it never works. And it always leads, leads to disaster. And yet we do it. And uh, one of the reasons is that we never learn and relearn lessons. There are quite a few lessons learned, but we do not apply them. It are, these are not lessons learned, but lessons noticed. So we make the same mistake all over again. And we carry out interventions all the time. And there is also now a strong sense, for example, if you, uh, you watch television the other day about what happened in the uh, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, then uh, Cameron, uh, the um, British Prime Minister, said, oh, it's appalling what's happening in Syria. And yes, it's appalling. And what's next? Are we going to carry out an intervention? And there is a strong sense among leaders that we should do so. And it will lead to this also, I can assure you. One more question maybe from um, me. Why is it that our conception of war is only based on um, military interventions? Because now the last 10 years, maybe the biggest war, maybe the bloodless crime has, been, has happened in the economic world, banking industry, financial industry. Yes. And that's one aspect. It's the most bloodless, but the ultimate crime, which is affecting the whole world. And also the whole virtual war, where China is, you know, going into the industrial secrets, into the company profiles and data. I mean, what is happening on the virtual sphere is probably as bloodless as the financial war that we have experienced. But still in our consciousness, it's not really kicking in. When we think of war, we're only thinking of military interventions. Yeah, and but there are interventions. For example, uh, uh, cyber war is already going on. Uh, you, you're all aware of this, 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 uh, the Stuxnet uh, attacks on, uh, on, on Iran, for example, uh, trying to harm uh, the nuclear program of, of Iran. Uh, there are constant um, cyber attacks from China uh, to, uh, on the US. Uh, what we see right now is a financial uh, um, a crisis I sometimes think that this is the equivalent of your third world war uh, for which you uh, try to, to build a monument. Uh, but this is a kind of e a equivalent of a, of a kind of third world European war. Um, because it, the damage is huge. Uh, it's partly rational and partly highly irrational. 
uh, it's about the sovereignty of states, it's about power politics. Do we want to have, for example, a transfer union uh, with man uh, money transferred from the rich north to, to the poor south? What do we want? Uh, we see suffering uh, in, in countries like, uh, like Greece. So it's, it's, it's a kind of war with another face. And, but the consequences are, are huge of, of, of this financial uh, crisis. And, and the same mechanisms apply, because usually wars can be prevented. And what we see right now with the financial crisis, everybody would uh, knew uh, that one, two years ago, there would be a contamination of and a, a spillover of the problem of Greece to uh, to Italy and Spain, and no one did something. So it's 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 the same kind of mechanisms uh, taking uh, place in the financial crisis as during real wars. So yes, uh, you're right. It's 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 war with another face. Uh, this morning, uh, this is a question for you. Uh, this morning, there was uh, an interview with Paul Anning in the Volkskrant, uh, Secretary General of the Department of Defense. I haven't seen him, but he is a good friend, yes. Excuse me? I haven't read the interview, oh, but they, oh. Anning is a good friend, yes. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he stated well. that uh, defense is good for uh, economy, and I, I don't think he meant building, for instance, naval ships and exporting them, but defense mission itself. Uh, do you agree with him? And are there no uh, substitutes? Do we need defense for the economy? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know why he uh, he gave this interview because he, he's on his way out. Uh, uh, no, defense is good for the economy. <laughs> believe it, believe it or not. Uh, first of all, you have of course the defense industry. That is jobs. It's about approximately fifteen thousand jobs in uh, the Netherlands. It's approximately. 3 billion euros to, uh, annual turnover. Um, it's about the production of your trade routes. Uh, it's no coincidence that a country uh, like the Netherlands contributes to the anti piracy uh, operation off the coast of uh, Somalia. Why is this? Because we have one of the biggest harbors in, uh, in the world. Um, and uh, providing peace and stability in the world. Uh, also is in the advantage of your uh, economy. For example, we uh, need uh, stable parts of the world where, for example, uh, raw materials and energy uh, resources are, are found. So you, you, there, is, there is an economic reason uh, to, uh, to carry out military operations and to have a defense. And um, if you don't have a defense or, uh, or armed forces, then you become a free rider. And that means that you can't protect your interests anymore. Uh, if, if this is what he, uh, what he means, I, I agree. And you can prove that this is the case. But this is a, a, an argument that is politically and um, uh, not really acceptable. And it is not supported by the large majority of the people. So what you see here is that you have rational uh, arguments uh, in, in favor of defense, but they are rejected because of, uh, of morality and uh, because people don't believe it and be because people reject, for good reasons, war. Uh, so this is uh, for, for defense and for Anink, uh, the Secretary General of, um, uh, of the Ministry of uh, Defense, uh, this is a, a very tough tough issue because they can't they can't sell it they can't sell it by uh, rational arguments and they have to find other arguments which are usually on the moral side and the ethical side and, and most of the arguments they use suck <laughs> I, I think you would agree that there is a big difference between having um, defense industry in order to defense, for example, the very um, um, current problem of the piracy. But there is a, it's not the same as selling, I mean, in Belgium a few years ago, there was a big um, fuzz or a very f funded fuzz um, about the government selling weapons to Nepal at the time when there was, yeah, there was a civil, 
uprisings in Nepal against the government, and then the Belgian government sold weapons to the Nepal government. So that's not the same. So I think I it, it does need a bit more nuance in the sense that we can have a defense economy, but literally for defense, not to make profit out of offense happening yeah, on the other I, side I of the world. That. Yes, yes, it's a moral issue. And you must be very careful uh, to who you sell your weaponry. That's, that's absolutely for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. So on that note, maybe, we thank our speakers and um, you from the South and Rob the Vike. Um, please join us downstairs in the consensus bar so, and uh, we can share a good glass of wine. Thank you very much. This was lovely.